Uh, so I'm going to interrupt the, the flow of visual representations uh, that we've had for, for uh, methodological reasons uh, that hopefully will become clear, at least in part, as I go on. Uh, I want to begin, of course, by thanking uh, Dominic and Andrea and Matt and everyone who made this possible, and also uh, want to take a moment to express my delight and gratitude to uh, my fellow presenters for just, it's been a really wonderful uh, symposium to be a part of. I've uh, learned a lot and I have a lot to, to think about. Um, so the reason Dominic invited me was not because I'm a literary scholar uh, who works on trauma, but because of this, this piece I wrote for the Times philosophy blog, Learning How to Die in the Anthropocene. Uh, which begins from the premise uh, that we're fucked, basically. <laughs> that we fail to prevent uh, catastrophic climate change, uh, and that we're not even prepared for the consequences of, of that change. Um, it's going to impact our civil, global civilization, uh, carbon civilization, uh, in countless ways. And we're just not, we're not ready. Um, you know, and the outcome looks pretty bleak. Uh, and, and my argument in that piece and, and in the longer book uh, that's come out of that uh, is that, you know, one, one ethical response to that uh, is, and an important one, is to turn to the humanities. Um, you know, different ways of thinking about it. Uh, I, I like the idea of energy humanities. Uh, but to turn to the humanities as a store of, of cultural technology that can help us adapt to the future, but also to turn to the humanities as, as a way of, of slowing um, possible, possible social movements and possible uh, you know, precipitous rushes into, into even greater catastrophes. And so what I'm going to talk about today is from uh, some bits from that book Cobbled Together, trying to, to draw the connection between environment and energy, trying to connect um, energy politics with social energetics uh, with a, a big dollop of war in the middle. So uh, and I might go a minute over, but, but no more than that. Um, <laughs> So when a honeybee colony needs to find a new home, it sends out wave after wave of scouts to search for a new hive site. When the scouts return, they dance for other bees. Each scout's dance communicates a possible location for the colony's future. As new waves of scouts go out and return, they align themselves with one dance or another, depending on what they found. Soon, in a vast, rollicking caucus, Masses of bees are all dancing to a variety of distinct rhythms, each dance offering a different vision of what the bee tomorrow. One dance may be for a nearby oak, another for a distant elm. One dance offers an ambitious flight, another is more conservative. Over time, a single dance grows more and more popular until the majority of the bees are doing it. The swarm has made its decision and takes flight. We might say that politics, whether for bees or for humans, is the energetic distribution of bodies and systems. This is where the idea of the vote, the town hall meeting, and the public debate get their power. Humans come together to resonate on one frequency or another. Arrangements of bodies and systems don't arise out of ideal notions of how governance should work, but emerge rather out of the bodies themselves, the systems they inhabit, and the interactions between the two. The key seems to be energy, energy production, and social energetics, social energy. Just as a beehive is structured around the production of honey, so are human societies structured around uh, horses, sheep, wheat, coal, and oil. How bodies harvest, produce, and organize energy determines how power flows, shaping the political arrangements of a given social organism behind whatever ideologies a uh, particular ruling class may use to manufacture consent, obscure the mechanism or convince themselves of their novel omniscience and wisdom. Uh, so humanity, and it's, this is a wonderful audience to speak to, and, um, you know, uh, because of the depth of knowledge about energy in this room, 
so I'm, I'm very conscious about you know, repeating things we also really know already, but uh, I'm just going to go with it and uh, um, hope you follow. Uh, so humanity has undergone three major revolutions right, in the political structure of energy production in the past 200,000 years. The agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and the great acceleration, the, which we might describe as the transition from coal to mixed fossil fuels. The agricultural revolution shifted human social organization from the pack to the herd, from nomadic life to sedentary life, um, from uh, tracking you know, great herds of biomass uh, across you know, the steppes and plains to cultivating energy stocks in place. Um, around 12,000 years after the development of agriculture, the industrial revolution shifted human social organization from photosynthetic stocks to fossilized carbon stocks. This freed us from our dependence on plant and animal energy and opened up incredible new flows of power while the organization of bodies around coal pits, railroads, and teeming cities in the 19th and early 20th centuries gave rise to mass social democracy, state nationalism, and industrial capitalism. As Timothy Mitchell argues in his book Carbon Democracy, the ability of tenacious, highly organized coal miners to interrupt energy flows gave them significant leverage in what had previously been essentially feudal and absolutist systems. Rulers were forced to listen to workers because coal miners at the forefront of the labor movement could interrupt the operations of an entire country. Uh, Mitchell writes, workers were gradually connected together, not so much by the weak ties of a class culture, collective ideology, or political organization, but by the increasing and highly concentrated quantities of carbon energy they mined, loaded, carried, stoked, and put to work. Coordinated acts of interrupting, slowing down, and diverting its movement created a decisive political machinery, a new form of collective capability built up of coal mines, railways, power stations, and their operators. That capability waned with the Great Acceleration in the middle of the 20th century as industrial societies shifted from reliance on coal to the mixed use of coal, oil, and natural gas, as we've seen today. Uh, labor retained vestigial power for decades but the realignment of energy flows from solid coal to liquid petroleum and natural gas weakened the effect of political power. Coal miners and their allies could leverage, substantially undermining mass social democracy as a technology of power. Unlike a coal-based economy, which relies on raw labor and numbers, oil and gas production requires relatively few workers. It just comes up out of the ground. Um, right, where coal must be physically dug out, transported by fixed rail lines, oil and gas pumped out from remote wells to ports where liquids are loaded onto tankers that can be sent practically anywhere and rerouted in transit with ease. As Mitchell, uh, oh, and oil and gas come to us through decentralized networks managed by small crews of highly trained technicians and owned by a handful of extremely wealthy corporations, nations, and individuals. As Mitchell explains, whereas the movement of coal tended to follow dendritic networks, uh, like a tree with branches at each end but a single main channel or trunk, creating potential choke points at several junctures, oil flowed along networks that often had the properties of a grid, like an electricity network, where there's more than one possible path and the flow of energy can switch to avoid blockages or overcome breakdowns. Populist movements that used to be able to organize around the centralized flows of coal are all the power <coughs> interrupting the much more flexible flows of oil and gas, isolated high-profile cases like the Keystone XL pipeline notwithstanding. So growing from and resonating with the flows of material power that sustain them, our political arrangements today are organisms of consuming bodies in decentralized systems managed by technicians for the profit of a few. At the top, there's an oligarchy of owners who control the lion's share of world energy production. They rule through a technocratic administrative class. <coughs> Most people participate, if at all, as consumers, watching the election games and, and voting for one of the handful of officially sanctioned candidates. The few activists who try to effect reform are hobbled by systemic constraints. Protest politics and web-based outrage may send signals to the ruling elites, but these strategies exert no pressure. No matter how many people take to the streets in massive marches or in, or in targeted direct actions, they cannot put their hands on the real flows of power. This is a problem, uh, in part because as our planet warms precipitously because of human action, putting us all in danger, many people uh, 
realize that we need to do something. Uh, our bee scouts, as it were, are buzzing. Uh, we need to fight. We need to identify the enemy, go after them. Others look away, deny what's happening, search out escape routes into imaginary futures, whether it's uh, you know, techno-utopia or life on Mars. Fight, flight, flight, fight. The fear of death lights up our deepest animal drive for survival. Those in power are likely to fight to keep it. Coal and oil companies and their government proxies have made their willingness to use military force to defend themselves and advance their interests spectacularly obvious. The labor wars of the 19th and 20th centuries show this clearly. The brutal decades-long war waged by the Nigerian government against its own people, uh, undertaken with the outright support of Shell and Chevron is another example. Um, and this self-defense uh, of the powerful will, will likely occur in, in an environment of unprecedented uh, political and uh, climate instability because of climate change. Uh, so consider Iraq. You know, what was once one of the most stable uh, westernized countries in the Middle East uh, with a strong, highly educated middle class is today being torn apart between a corrupt petrocracy, a breakaway ethnic Kurdish enclave, a self-declared Islamic fundamentalist caliphate, and a civil war in neighboring Syria that is spilled across its borders. These conflicts have likely been caused in part and exacerbated by the worst drought the Middle East has seen in modern history. Since 2006, Syria has been suffering crippling water shortages that have, in some areas, caused 75% crop failure and wiped out 85% of livestock, left more than 800,000 Syrians without a livelihood, and sent hundreds of thousands of impoverished young men streaming into Syria's cities, where they then join you know, one or another uh, militia. The, this drought is part of a long-term warming, it's part of long-term warming and drying trends that are transforming the Middle East. Not just water, but oil, too, obviously central to these conflicts. Iraq sits on the fifth largest proven oil reserves in the world. The Islamic State has been able to survive only because it has taken control of most of Syria's oil and gas production. According to retired Navy Rear Admiral David Tidley, you can draw a very credible climate connection to this disaster we call ISIS right now. So droughts in 2014 sent refugees from Guatemala and Honduras north the American border devastated crops in California, Australia, and threatened millions of lives in Eritrea, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, Afghanistan, India, Morocco, Pakistan, and parts of China. Across the world, massive protests and riots have swept Bosnia and Herzegovina, Venezuela, Brazil, Turkey, Egypt, and Thailand, while conflict rages on in Colombia, Libya, the Central African Republic, Sudan, Nigeria, India, Yemen, Ukraine, and Gaza. While the world burns, the United States has been playing chicken with Russia over control of Eastern Europe and with China over control of Southeast Asia, threatening global war on a scale not seen in 70 years. Our future, our Anthropocene future, promises to be as violent as our carbon or pre-carbon past. While it's true that true centuries of carbon fueled economic plenty and the widespread ramification of state control have led to a general decrease in daily violence, at least in industrialized nations, the human animal has not purged itself of bloodlust nor have we put war and violence aside as solutions to political problems. Uh, in order to come to an understanding of what it will mean to live in the Anthropocene, we must begin to understand what the Greek philosopher Heraclitus meant when he wrote, it should be understood that war is the common condition, that strife is justice, and that all things come to pass through the compulsion of strife. We live in this world of strife. We experience it today in one of two modes. Either it's our environment and we're in it, or it comes to us in images, social excitation and retransmitted fear. People are fighting and dying in ruined cities all over the planet. Old women are bleeding to death in bombed rubble, probably right now. Children are being murdered, <coughs> neighbors are killing each other. To live in that world is horrific. Constant danger puts every nerve on edge. The only things that matter there are survival, killing the enemy, reputation, and having a safe place to sleep. The human becomes a beast, alternately terrified and savage, abject and cruel. I remember living in that world many years ago in occupied Baghdad. Today, that world seems impossibly distant, yet war presses in on me every 
every day in a never-ending stream of words, images, appeals, and reports. I see videos, I read stories, I see pictures of this or that injustice, and I'm moved to act, perhaps, but more accurately to emote, to react, to perform, to feel. Pictures of children killed by bombs or police or pictures of the devastation left in the wake of a tropical storm may move me to sadness and horror. Retransmitting such images will pass along that sadness and horror. My act of retransmission will mark me as someone who has feelings about these things and who condemns them. I can rationalize my, my retransmission by saying that I'm raising awareness or trying to influence public policy. I want my fellow citizens to also be horrified, so perhaps they'll think like I do, or perhaps they'll vote for a representative who works to prevent such horrors from happening. Or maybe so that if enough of us all think the same way and feel the same way, the organs and institutions of power will be forced to hear us and align themselves along our vibrations, the way a honeybee colony will pick a new hive through the dance of its scouts. These are perfectly reasonable human assumptions because that's how physical human collectives function. Anyone who's been in a crowd or a sports game, or a nightclub, or a choir, or a protest, knows how bodies resonate together. But politics is the energetic distribution of bodies and systems. And we live in a system of carbon-fueled capitalism that we can't depend on to work in physical, human, collective ways for several reasons, especially when it comes to responding to the threat of global warming. First, our political and social media technologies are not neutral, but have been developed to serve particular interests most notably targeted advertising, concentration of wealth, and theological control. And the vibrations that seem to resonate most strongly along these channels are not particularly helpful to us. The, the pity, adulation, outrage, fear. Second, the more we pass on or react to social vibrations, the more we strengthen our habits of channeling, and the less we practice autonomous reflection or independent critical thought. With every protest chant, retweet, or Facebook post, we become stronger resonators and weaker thinkers. Third, however intense our social vibrations grow, they remain sequestered within machines that offer no political leverage. They do not translate into political action. They don't connect to the flows of power. Finally, while the typical collective human response to collective threat is to name an enemy, pick sides, and mobilize communities to fight, global warming offers no obvious foe. That hasn't stopped people from trying to find one. The People's Climate March protesters, you know, targeted American corporations as the enemy. Tanzania's Jakaya Kikwete and Nauru's Baramaka at the UN Climate Summit said the problem was the US and Great Britain. Uh, Shell Oil and the Environmental Defense Fund at, the, at the, uh, um, the meeting of the IETA seem to suggest that it's intractable UN bureaucracy that's holding us up. Barack Obama has implied that it's China. Tea Party Republicans would probably blame Barack Obama if they admitted that global warming was real. <laughs> Meanwhile, and listening liberals want to believe that the Tea Party Republicans are responsible so they can frame the problem as one amenable to solution by moral education and enlightened consumerism, as if it were all a matter of convincing people to eat more kale and drive electric cars. Mm -hmm. One climate activist has argued that just 90 companies are responsible for almost two-thirds of all historical greenhouse gas emissions, which conveniently absolves billions of automobile drivers, airline passengers, uh, train passengers, meat eaters, and cell phone users of any responsibility. The enemy isn't out there somewhere. The enemy is ourselves, not as individuals, but as a collective, a system, a hive. How do we stop ourselves from fulfilling our fates as suicidally productive drones in a self-consuming, sort of pathologically collapsing hive? How do we interrupt the perpetual circuits of fear, aggression, crisis, and reaction that continually prod us to ever more intense levels of manic despair or dissociation? One way we might begin to answer these questions but is by considering the problem of global warming in terms of Peter Sloterdijk's the German philosopher too. Sloterdijk's theorization of the public role of the philosopher, which he sees as embodying a certain resistance to social energetics as such. A long quote from Sloterdijk here. We live constantly in collective fields of excitation. This cannot be changed so long as we are social beings. 
The input of stress inevitably enters me. Thoughts are not free. Each of us can divine them. They come from the newspaper and wind up returning to the newspaper. My sovereignty, if it exists, can only appear by my letting the integrated impulsion die in me, or, should this fail, by my retransmitting it in a totally metamorphosed, verified, filtered, or recoded form. It serves nothing to contest it. I am free only to the extent that I interrupt escalations and that I am able to immunize myself against infections of opinion. Precisely this continues to be the philosopher's mission in society, if I may express myself in such pathetic terms. His mission is to show that a subject can be an interrupter, not merely a channel that allows thematic epidemics and waves of excitation to flow through it. The classics express this with the term pondering. With this concept, ethics and energetics enter into contact. As a bearer of a philosophical function, I have neither the right nor the desire to be either a conductor in a stress semantic chain or the automaton of an ethical imperative. He gets in his little dig against Kant there. Um, so Slaughterdyke compares the conception of political function as collective vibration to a philosophical function of interruption. As opposed to disruption, a very popular uh, on the West Coast these days, which is about shocking a system and breaking holes into pieces, interruption is about suspending continuous processes. Slaughterdyke sees the role of the philosopher in the human swarm as that of an aberrant antidrome, slow dancing to its own rhythm. Neither attuned to the collective beat nor operating mechanically, dogmatically, or deontologically, but interrupting the waves of social energy we live in and amongst. So long as one allows oneself to be a conductor in a stress semantic chain, one is strengthening channels of retransmission regardless of contact. Thickening the reflexive connected tissues of mass society, making all of us all more susceptible to such viral phenomena as nationalism, scapegoating, panic, and war fever. Interrupting the flows of social production is anarchic and counterproductive, like all good philosophy. If it works, it makes us stop, reconsider our assumptions, and see our world in new ways. If it fails, as it often, and maybe even usually does, the interrupter is integrated, ignored, or destroyed, as were Socrates or Ken Sarawiba. What Slutterdyke helps us see is that responding autonomously to social excitation means not reacting to it, not passing it on, but interrupting the excitation then either letting it die or completely transforming it. Responding freely to constant images of fear and violence, responding freely to the perpetual media circuits of pleasure and terror, responding freely to the ongoing alarms of war, catastrophe, and climate change, demands a reorientation of feeling so that every new impulse is held at a distance until it can be controlled. While life beats its red rhythms and human swarms dance to the compulsion of strife, the philosopher practices dying. Paradoxically, as our civilization rushes toward its collective doom, this may be our only hope for a human life.